Hello again, welcome to the Music Ally Focus podcast with me, Music Ally's editor Joe Sparrow. And in this episode, we're very happy to welcome Pamela McCormick and Dr. Anne-Marie Imaphidon, MBE, of London-based organisation United Development, who will be talking to me about supporting and developing young black musicians and industry talent. They also chatted to me about the state of representation in the UK music industry and what you can do, yes you, to make gradual and helpful improvements to the industry in that regard. Uh, now, each Music Ally Focus episode analyzes one meaningful music business story at a time, just like this one, and thus this podcast is going to be quick. It should take about the same amount of time in which Kevin Strahler could hypothetically eat 180 popsicles. Kevin ate six in one minute in 2017, and presumably the subsequent brain freeze subsided in 2018. Now, talking of cool things, United Development, or UD for short, is a London-based music organisation bringing communities together around black music and black music culture. For 20 years, UD has acted as a bridge between burgeoning talent and the music industry through industry-led business and employment support programmes, career guidance, access to resources and showcasing and so on. Pamela McCormick is founder and CEO of UD and Dr. Anne-Marie Imaphidon, MBE, was recently appointed chair of UD. And they had loads of really interesting things to say about the state of the industry and the work they're doing and the wider needs for representation in the music industry. Let's hop over to them now. So extremely happy to welcome to the Music on I Focus podcast, Dr. Anne-Marie Imaphidon and Pamela McCormick. Thanks for joining me. Hello, thanks for welcome. Now, I want to talk to you about the concept of supporting and developing young black musicians and industry talent, the work that uh, UD as an organization is doing, and also topics around the state of representation in the UK industry and what our listeners can do to make gradual improvements and changes in the industry in that regard. Before we dig into all that, could you introduce yourselves individually and, and explain what you do at UD, please? So, hi, I'm Anne Marie, and I am chair, I'm brand new chair, brand spanking new chair at UD. Uh, since April 2023 and before that I've been a trustee of the charity uh, but I am a social entrepreneur, uh, an author, a leader and a speaker who cares quite a lot about diversity, about inclusion, about uh, awareness of opportunities um, and I'm an incredibly proud East Londoner. Excellent, a very comprehensive introduction, uh, Something for you to live up to there, Pamela. <laughs> Never, I can do that. Um, uh, yes, I'm the founder and current director of UD. Um, so my role is strategic and fundraising, working with the board and the team. Um, I've done the work since the late 90s, initially with a group of artists, and it's grown to um, you know almost a million pound business over a almost 25 year period um, and the work focuses around education talent development showcasing and progression towards the industry so I guess my work over the past 25 years has been doing that right okay that's, that's some good context we've got there and perhaps Pamela will continue with you then immediately we have an international audience of course so could you explain how UD works what does it do and what impact does it have the Overall plan is to have a centre of excellence in black music culture rooted in East London because it's important to be connected with young people on the ground, but with national profile and reach. I guess that's the overarching ambition. Um, and the programme is um, a series of projects that form a progression route from school outreach, youth access and engagement, community engagement, um, through a series of um, age group progression, through to supporting artists to release music to the market. So right. in microcosm, I guess, it could be seen as um, a model that could be replicated elsewhere. Um, you know, we've borrowed the... Um, the systems that exist currently primarily focused on Western classical music. And we're kind of saying that black music needs the same level of sustained development as exists in the more traditional Western classical music um, yeah, systems. Anne-Marie, how does that then, from your perspective, how does that happen 
from, from a sort of day-to-day functional perspective. So at, the, at, the, at UD, it happens yeah. in a number of different ways. And whether that's providing education opportunities, whether that's providing network opportunities, we've you know just opened our talent house, which is our, our national space for folks to come together and um, enjoy black music, be uh, engaged with black music, learn around the mechanics of what goes on to produce, to make, to market, you know, the A&R, all of the, the stack that goes on behind black music in the industry and should be happening uh, much more representatively. So for us, it's around, you know, providing those opportunities, creating the space for that to happen um, and allowing folks to gain a lot of the, the kind of cultural capital that they need in order to build uh, music careers and succeed in this space. So there's there's lots of different ingredients, a lot of collaboration, a lot of support from partners. Maybe we could have many, much more much more support, you know, as a as a chair from many more partners. But it's about folks using their agency, you know, particularly for folks that are listening to this, using their agency, using the opportunities that they do have, the leverage that they have to open that up to the types of folks that we really, unfortunately, don't have across industry. And that's sort of uh, where we're going towards with this conversation and, mm. and is sort of quite um, closely connected to your overall task. You as, a, as an organisation, I mean, have a, a really good view of the young black professionals in the UK music industry, as well as you're obviously dealing with those at the, at the, uh, who are entering it or trying to enter it um, from, from that level as well. When you look at their journey from your position, what do you see? And what changes are needed in that sort of broader sense, but maybe also a sort of functional um, day-to-day sense as well? Um, I I guess our work is um, around skills development and building up music industry knowledge um, over a period of time. You know, sustained development takes time. Um, You know, it's probably, you know, from the beginning to end of our programme, it's a sort of eight year journey if you were to go all the, all the way through in terms of age group so you know there's it, it's understanding that um it, it is a deeper piece of work to make change happen um but fundamentally i think Anne marie just um mentioned it there i think i think young people um that we work with um who are typically facing racial inequality but also socioeconomic disadvantage you know I think fundamentally it's it's also about access to networks you know collectively putting our arm our arm around them and making introductions and putting them in the room with uh inspirational role models who have gone a little bit before them you know the 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 music industry has changed hugely since we first did this work in the late 90s you know presidents of record labels like Alec and Alex Joe Kentish you know people who um are in positions of, of, of leadership. So it's come a long way. Um, so they are fundamental role models. So we, we are attempting to bring uh, those black music professionals into the same room as the young people we're developing in order for them to see the potential journey ahead of them. So yeah, I, I say skills, experience and access to network and resources. You know, the Talent House is all about um, creating a space that is... Um, psychologically philosophically kind of owned by young people you know a, a, a strong sense of ownership and empowerment um so that they are um engaged in the programs that we deliver we're developing a scheme around peer leadership um so it's encouraging that confidence and and belief i think looking at it from perhaps a little bit of a a perspective of time it's clear that change is needed change is happening what has that change been like is, is there any way that you can sort of quantify the change that has happened and how can you use that as a sort of measure of where to go fundamentally the space we're in is very different to the late 90s you know we started with hip-hop culture which is very much sort of community-led music and now we're talking about pop music you know playing black music plays a, you know a significant role within the economy of of of, of the wider music industry um so it, it's 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 a bit of a game changing shift in that sort of 25 year um period um in terms of you know just just you know looking at the uk music diversity stats you know i think there's been a bit of a drop off recently on um black and brown young people um uh entering and in, in entry level positions 
you know, I think there's been a bit of a drop there. Um, and I think overall, the total number of employees from ethnically diverse communities compared to the last survey has dropped. So we've been doing really, really well, but it looks to me as if there's been a bit of a drop in the last um, few years. Um, and I think, um, you know, being in the room in, in when reports are, are fed back, I think there's still a concern about whether people are progressing enough. Um, mm. You know, so historically, the industry had been doing quite well at entry level positions. Um, there's some movement around people staying and progressing, but I guess it's not substantive enough across the entire music industry. So I think we have to reflect that, you know, a, a lot of good work has been done, um, but there's still a, a lot more to do. In, in terms of our work, um, uh, you know, I can point to a few, you know, significant examples of people who have touched upon, you know, touched us at the early stages of, the, of, the, of their careers, and they're now in significant um, positions within, you know, artist side and, and the executive side. Um, I think the only thing I, I would emphasise is that change does take, just take a time, it does take a while. Um, just referring to the kind of the, 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 the changes that are happening within, within UD, you know, the, the, the new building, you know, it, it ended up being a £4.1 million project. You know, it took us seven years to raise that money to be able to put this place on the map. Um, you know, we've now been given recognition as being a national youth music organisation, which is going to enable us to roll out work outside of London. But that's going to be another three to five year project, really, to make that sort of change mm. happen. Um uh, but you know, hopefully, what we'll be able to do over the next few years is is sort of double, you know, double the impact, double the reach using um, the, the 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 you know the centre that we've created and that kind of national ambition to do even more work to help the industry with those um, diversity targets. That pace is something which other guests have said to me as well, which is that change, systemic change, yeah. is is long term, and you have to you have to buy into the long term vision, albeit while people want change as fast as possible. And that's a, that's, a, that's a difficult tension, isn't it, in the middle of it? I think it's a, it's a difficult tension, but it's also worth noting that, you know, we're, you know, Pamela was talking about, you know, in the 90s you had hip hop. Now we've got new genres that have been spawned, mm. right, that this current generation is enjoying, that are, that are also enjoying kind of really big global commercial success. And so I think there is something to be said for as slowly as, as, as uh, you know, there is some changes, there have been other changes that have been incredibly fast, mm -hmm. incredibly large. And so how do we ensure that that, you know, that gusto, that enjoyment, that um, hunger for change in something new, right, and an evolution is something that we're seeing on both sides, or on all sides of the music industry, rather than it just being mm. in, you know, certain genres that then are now are really, really popular without us ensuring that we've got the right kind of infrastructure behind that also you know, has the folks that are, you know, leading in that music also being yeah. popular, right, uh, within yeah. organisations and being folks that are valued internally um, and on the exec side, as well as being valued on the artist side. And so I think that is definitely something that there's definitely a source of frustration for me as chair in seeing changes like that happening without folks really being, you know, properly recognised, remunerated, valued internally at, across the music industry. Right. You, you mentioned infrastructure there and what are the hurdles that are perhaps baked into the industry and its current structure? Ones that perhaps if you're in the music industry and have been for a while, you're not inherently good at seeing, but you can see if you're trying to force change through. Uh, I mean, this, this, this topic was actually de debated um, on one of our panels during industry takeover. And, you know, there, there was definitely a strong case being made for, um, black professionals being in positions of power and, and influence and, and governance, yeah. you know, that, that um, you know, referring to the presidents of labels that I mentioned earlier, um, clearly that, that, that is amazing. Um, but I, 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 think, I think there was a case being made for ownership of the structures of, of power, perhaps requiring further shift to really um, have that balance, I think. And how how does that change come about? It's I guess that's a systemic change. Yes, a systemic. So I, I, I guess it's um, both growth of the independent sector on one level, 
and and I guess on another, it's um, ownership of the major bodies, I suppose, and to, to to purely you know to properly reflect the demographic of society. You know that it, it should be the, the, the equity should be at every level. Yeah, I th- I think it's definitely that equitable practice. And I think it's folks making a concerted effort to ensure that they are, you know, looking for for equity and realising and recognising where there's been difference beforehand and how that might have filtered into, you know, the assumptions that you make about folks that might come through the organisations or the assumptions you might make in promotion panels. There was kind of parallels between maybe the sports world or even the tech world that folks were talking Mm. about where, you know, you do need to hold folks accountable in the processes and the way that they do business. And actually that's where systemic change can come. But as Pamela said, if you've got folks, if you've got different types of folks that are then able to be promoted through the ranks, right, or have that kind of progression, then you are able to change the norms and you are able to evolve those norms that then actually what does it look like for you to have black artists that, you know, are truly, you know, nourished, right, that feel uh, supported in their roles and where actually they, they don't end up feeling like they're misunderstood or like marketing is going a particular way or like the the creative direction that they want to go in is is not understood by the folks that are supposed to be supporting them or the system that they're operating in if they're going to be a music artist. So I think there's there's parallels in lots of different places, but this is about power. As Pamela said, this yeah. is about structures mm-hmm. and this is about who is valued and who is not and what is valued and what is not. Um, and so I think equitable is is the big word. It's a big word. <laughs> you know, it's easy to say, maybe slightly harder to do, especially yeah. if we haven't had that approach. But I think that is that is the big watch word for folks to kind of delve a little bit more into. And and the big theme that I, you know, retain from um, the artist representation on that particular panel was, you know, to enable artists to tell their own story. It, it requires an understanding Um uh, and a support structure within uh, the decision makings of the music industry. Um, uh, you know that that was a very very clear case was being made is um, to be surrounded by people who understand the story and understand the journey. Yeah, now and perhaps part of that progress, um, Amory, you, you mentioned there the word accountability, mm. and I've, I've we, we hear this come up a lot when we talk about making these kind of changes. So. Again, that's, that's another big word. Let's say people are listening here and they're saying, okay, I, I'm, I want to make these kind of changes. I want accountability towards me and I want to be able to make accountability changes. But these are, these are the kind of concepts which people are, a lot of people want, but it's, it's, it's sort of hard to know where to start, isn't it? Because it, obviously a lot of these problems are solved by moving a lot of things forward at the same time. In, in, in our case, it's intentionality. And the intentionality is often linked to um, both our own um, mission, vision and values, but also um, the transaction that we make with people who give us money. Um, it's, not ne- it's not imposed, but we are proposing the impact of our work. So we set targets. So I can tell you now our targets are at least 70% um, global majority or black and minority ethnic um, beneficiaries on, in our program. So that, that's, that's there in black and white. And we uh, evaluate ourselves based on that target. In actual fact, most years we completely exceed it, but, but that, that is our minimum benchmark. Um, gender, it's the same, e- equality. Um, and that's how we do it. Um, I don't think, you know, I think imposing targets on, organizations I think it's a tricky thing and and I know that some people are calling for that and I guess it has to be brokered and advocated over time but um, you know speaking for the organization that we are we set our own targets because it's important we're very proud of those and we're proud of our track record and and that actually is um, you know how we know that we are succeeding you know the the sort of access targets you know that the we, we we sort of track our work based on access, which is numbers, reach, demographics. We track on quality. We've got measures around quality. We track on progression. So we want to make sure that we are setting targets and then holding ourselves to account against people's journeys. And that means skills. It means industry knowledge. It means um, 
moving through the organization of different programs. It means mm. progressing beyond. It means jobs, you know, and that, that, that is our bread and butter. You know, that's how we hold ourselves to account. I think across the industry, yeah. it's taking that same approach and scaling it up. So it's, it's being intentional because, it, you know, we, the, the, you, we would say if you're not intentionally inclusive, you end up being unintentionally exclusive. But I think it is about iterating on that and saying, actually, you know, George Floyd was murdered. There's a whole load of things that we did. And then what? Where's the mm. evaluation of that? Where's the audit of where that went and what happened next? And then what are we now going to do to build on that and, and intentionally move in a particular direction? Um, And so accountability then says, okay, if we don't do that, what are the penalties? What are the levers that we have? What are the things that we're going to lose out on? Or what are the, what is the extra work that we're going to have to take on and do? And I think, you you know, you don't have to, don't have to jump too far on accountability. We're held accountable on lots of different, uh, you know, strata, lots of different ways, right? That it's like, you know, if you don't make revenues, right, you're held accountable. What are the levers you have for that? If your conduct is not, Mm. you know, what it's supposed to be, you're held accountable. What does that look like? And so I think there's definitely levers that we can borrow and the folks in organizations that have the agency to do so can borrow to say, okay, cool. Well, how are we going to hold ourselves accountable if we don't move the needle on yeah. what these promotions look like or who we have in the team or mm. the experience of the folks in the team or the pay gap in the team or the stay gap in the team. And so I think there's a lot of that. There's a, there's a lot of levers that folks have and it's, it'd be an iterate, iterate on them, which are the ones that, that have worked before, which are the ones that haven't. And how can you ensure that you can do better? And I think ultimately all of this is about doing better, right? It's better business. It's better for society. It's better for the people that we have internally. It's better for the other folks that we should have in our organizations. And so you, you know, I, I do end up and end up talking to folks about, you know, what's the legacy of all of this? Like, are you mm. going to be able to look back and be proud of, you know, the, the legacy mm. that you had as a music professional because of the decisions that you made and the things that you were able to say, we did do that. We did make those strides. We did make that happen. Um, long, long, long after, you know, you're, you're working. Right. And so I think that's, that's the other thing to maybe hold on to for folks uh, that are listening in. Yeah. We've spoken to a number of guests before on similar topics and people who were aiming, for instance, to disrupt what they would call the pipeline issue mm. where there's a, there's a, a desire to, get underrepresented people into positions of seniority, but there's a sort of self-perpetuating effect because you you need people in these positions of seniority to sort of, for them to be seen so that you can bring people into those positions of seniority, something you sort of mentioned at the beginning, Pamela. Mm. And you've already sort of talked about how these things take time, mm. but of course things can be sort of moved along a little bit faster when there is a desire to do it. So, this is a complicated one, isn't it? Because it's a sort of uh, uh, chicken and egg scenario. How do you, how do you sort of look at ways of, of practically disrupting that pipeline issue? Uh, recruitment processes, I think. Um, I, you know, I, I'm very aware you can't ask people to move on from their from their jobs. You know, so it 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 is a bit of a natural process, um, but. It, I think fundamentally it's it's who do you want to have working for you and how are you going to reach those people and how are you going to progress them within the organisation, um, even if at times that means additional development to enable that growth. Um, you know, it goes back to the intentionality point, really. It's, it's reflecting on the type of organisation one should have in the current economy, you know, and it should be reflective of, the population on the whole, it should be. Otherwise, it is, mm. it is inequitable. Um, and what moves you're going to make to make sure that you have the appropriate level to, of talent at the appropriate level of jobs. And, and I think I would advocate for organisations like UD because we can certainly help with that. We can certainly help prepare people um, for the, the initial journey uh, towards the workforce. Um, mm. But then it is the, you know, the employers themselves that have to take responsibility for the development of staff and leaders internally. Um, um, I mean, I I would probably advocate for, you know, greater join up between the sector like UDs and, and, and the industry so that we can all be part of that overall um, change. Um, 
and and work you know really well as as partners you know with that overarching goal because it is a bigger societal change needed than any one individual organization can achieve on their own um but yes um it, it's all sorts of uh development programs you are mentoring um i mean I, I think i've heard anecdotally that sometimes and it may be more of a kind of recent past thing than a, than a current thing um uh you know young people are recruited into entry level jobs in let's say a big employer but they feel a little bit isolated you know that it, it it's about that kind of buddying and mentoring that goes on internally um um as well as you know you know and, and even in UD when we rec- recruit people nobody's perfect there's always development needs and it's how you're p- prepared to have that open conversation about um we think you're really great but these are the areas where we need and you know that that, that I think that's the only way is, is, is to support people to progress. You mentioned that partnership and your sort of desire for increased partnership this because it is a, a such a big picture thing I'm sure you're not finding sort of um people in opposition to what you're doing but what does that sort of lack of where, where there are not partnerships where you'd really like them what what are, what is the root of that absence of partnership just saying you want to do something doesn't then necessarily mean that the change then ends up coming mm. and so i think a lot of the time there's the mechanics or the actual work that's involved in supporting that actually it you know this isn't always sexy work to do right and so it's mm. it needs that sustained effort the sustained time the sustained investment to ensure that not only does the change you know continue to happen but like it's it's reinforced there's a backstop on that that that's that that funding continues that program continue the, the mentoring can happen the support can continue and can be su- sustained and i think that does end up being maybe some of where what could be great partnerships end up falling short because someone wants to come and do just one thing or one big bang and it's like well it's not just one big policy change or one big launch that's going to make that sustained change it's continually doing this day in day out in the decisions that you make in the way that you run business in you know in running the partnership and being there for you know we run academic programs throughout that process every year year on year that's going to be something that's continued and so I think it's folks being able to have stamina I think actually to be able to contribute to that change that then can be at the scale that we need to see it so I think that's definitely an element of it um but also saying that there's stamina on both ends and I guess to Pamela's point you know, UD is sat in that space of attraction and early stage careers, but then what goes on after when that person is inside the, inside the organization, how are you making sure that you're retaining them and they feel that sense mm. of belonging as they build their career and also that you're valuing them and you're promoting them, which if you're not doing that, then, you know, if we go to that idea of the pipeline, the pipe can have several leaks, right? Which is the, mm. which is the whole point. And so it's, you can, we can do all the work we want to do to attract, but if we do all of that, and then folks aren't don't then remain in the industry for whatever problems that there are, then we're going to continue to have, you know, it would be a slightly different version of the problem, but it's the same problem of not having the right representation across industry. And, and I just want to add something is, is I guess where there are, um, I'm talking about external development programs and, and yeah. not internal workforce development programs. Um, you know, maybe it's more fragmented than, than it could be. Perhaps there's more we could all do as a sector to collaborate you know i'm grateful for every penny that a music industry partner has ever given us but it, it it's it's quite project driven or, or it's um it's, it's relatively small corporate social responsibility type pots of money and and you know i'm very intrigued by you know ppl starting to look at something where they are considering um investing in um you know workforce development talent development based on a demographic you know based on uh population and and you know that that's quite interesting as a concept i haven't got enough of the the detail yet but it it it's it's actually thinking um you know, we are going to make an investment based on the population or per head or an, or or, a, or a, a, a unit of investment um um but you know that that in of itself is great but then i think generally there's 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 something around joining up you know the the fe sector the he sector the the non-formal sector which we are in identifying models of good practice investing more you know outside of when when somebody lands on your door already sort of 
showing high potential. There's a lot of work will have gone on behind the scenes somehow. And, and it would be great if there was more recognition of that and what it takes to, to, to get to that point. And, yeah. you know, our main funding comes from Arts Council or, you know, Trust and Foundation. We've got quite a broad brush. But, you know, one could argue that organisations like UD and, and many others are kind of doing that development work before um, it lands in the industry. And, and you know, may, maybe there is a, 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 a greater need for recognising that perhaps perhaps the industry should recognise that and invest more up for discussion. I mean, it sounds like it makes sense, doesn't yeah. it? If, you, if, if you're going to be beneficiaries of the talent that yeah. comes through and it's better for everybody, then, uh, you know, yeah. investing downwards is okay, isn't it? That's, that would yeah. make sense. And I will, I will put your contact information next to the podcast <laughs> if anyone's listening and that sounds like a good idea to them. Um, I mean, there are a lot of people listening who are eager to make change. You know, they, they, like I said before, there is the statistics show that people are really wanting to do this. Um, and one thing I've also heard this is anecdotal, but talking to people is that they're sort of, it, it, it's such a big picture change and over a long period of time, it's difficult to sort of understand where you are and where you can start and what the changes that you can make. Now, I know that you don't have a sort of glib magic bullet solution of like, here's what you can go and do. But it, for someone who's listening and, and thinking that, what is what is your advice to someone who is eager to start and just doesn't know in which direction? Um, I, I think it is engaging with um, organisations or schools or colleges or, or, you know, it's that kind of outreach work to sort of shift the pipeline coming in, I think. Um, um, yeah, I, th- I think it fundamentally starts there to, to change the, the shape of the people who are applying for the jobs. It requires work, I think, and... and um, rather than, and I suppose, rather than each individual organisation to attempt to start that from scratch, you know, there, you know, maybe there is something to be said for working with other organisations. I mean, it, it's also the reason why um, I think speakers come and get involved with our panels or mm. deliver masterclasses. It, it is about early sight of talent engagement. Um, you know, that's why people volunteer their time. That's why people partner with organisations like us is, 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 is to put people in the room with those target young people. So not, maybe not every music industry organisation is doing that. You know, the, all the ones we work with, Universal, TikTok, um, PPL, um, MPG, you know, that, that, and Warner, you know, that, that's, that's what they're trying to do really is, is to engage in early talent. So I think that's where I would recommend people start um, is, is connecting up with people and organisations and, and um, education providers who are in a position to bring different sorts of young people through. Mm. And that, I mean, you know, if you are in a position where you're looking to bring new people into the organisation, outreach is something that's not easy. But you, you, you can you, you're familiar with that kind of landscape and you can yeah. identify new places to go to. Yeah, I think the other thing is have a think about the agency that you do have internally. Yeah. So if you are a hiring manager, right. if you are senior, you know, if you do have a network that you can, affinity network that you can join, you know, within your organization, make sure that you are also, you know, leaning on those levers and, you know, doing doing things where you are in the way that you do business in addition to doing outreach work. So I think I think it's a it's a bit of it's a bit of both. What can you do internally and what can you do externally? And have a look and, and see where, you know, what's your sphere of influence? Right. Uh, and and yeah. inf- in, enact change within that uh, and, and get better. Right. And, and improve and, and iterate yeah. as well on that. Yeah. And, and so I guess a good starting point is, is, is having awareness or learning the, the awareness that you need. And then and then having intentionality around what you do next, which is something that anyone can anyone can start to to, to try and change. isn't it? I think it's identifying what success looks like in this regard and working back. OK, so you can set a target of, of what you within your world, your industry understand the change and, and, and work towards it through intentionally uh, like that. Okay, good advice for, for everybody. Thank you for that. Um, so I will put some links, obviously, to um, UD and, and, and your, the various things you mentioned, including your conference and, and the different programs you run, and people can check those out and uh, hopefully get in touch. Uh, 
and maybe yeah, maybe with some extra uh, contributions for you as well. Uh, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Um, and finally, f- f- from both of you, for a little bit of sort of extra context, we talk on this podcast almost uniformly about music business, but not so much about the music. So I'd like to ask you both maybe the hardest question, which is, if you could only listen to one piece of music for the rest of your life, what would it be? Miles Davis, A Kind of Blue. You know what? I think you might be the first person to have chosen that, which is remarkable, isn't it? Mm-hmm. But uh, a good, solid choice, uh, mm-hmm. Pamela. Thank you. No pressure, Emery. That, that, that was a good one. I actually pulled out my phone to look at how many times I listened to this song, how many hours I played of this song last year. Okay. Um, but it's Cool as the Breeze, Friday by Chronics. And okay. I don't know what, there's something about the song that I just can kind of end up. It there's puts that you in that and, flow state. Yeah, yes, exactly. That's what it is. It puts me in a flow, in a flow state. And how many times have you listened to it last year? Are you willing to admit I, that? I don't know if I can find it quickly enough. <laughs> okay, that's okay. But I think we can assume it's a lot then. A lot, I mean, I think it was a couple of days worth. Or something wow. like that. Yeah, That's... it puts me in a trance and I'm hyper productive for that song. Um be interested to see whether you feel the same this time next year, Maria, whether there'll be another one. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, um, thanks ever so much, um, Anne Marie and Pamela. Really uh, great of you to, to join us here. And I hope you know, maybe in uh, maybe in a year or so we can check in again and see how things are, are going in terms of change and we'll see if uh Anne Marie's uh, song has changed. <laughs> And there we are. So thank you very much to both Pamela and Dr. Anne-Marie uh, for joining me on the podcast. Don't forget, I've put a lot of links to uh, a number of the projects they've mentioned below this podcast. Uh, and you can check them out there and even get in touch with them uh, as per their recommendation. If you found that useful, please share the podcast on with someone else who you think will get something out of it. And if you want to get in touch with me, I'd love to hear from you. You can email me as ever that's joe at musically.com. That's joe, J-O-E, at musically.com. We also have a free weekly email called The Knowledge, which rounds up a soup song of the best analysis, news, marketing insight, and skills from Music Ally's broad range of services. It'll drop into your inbox every Friday, so sign up and impress your boss. Links are in the description as ever. So thanks for listening. I've been Joe Sparrow, and you, as ever, have been our delightful audience. And until next time, farewell.